is that within each human being, the five step process for healing is already within us. And so this is what narrative is. It, at its deepest level is a five step process to heal the human soul, mind, psyche, whatever you want to call it. And that's the power we have as storytellers. And so the five acts to me correlate to these five psychological steps to the five seasons, the five senses, the uh, fivefold nature of reality. Hello and welcome to Magical Writing. It has been so long uh, since we've seen everybody. We're back, uh, S.C. Mendes and of course, Joseph Sale. And if you've noticed, I'm introducing and we've swapped pos positions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the reason he's a much better introducer of things, see what a horrible uh, vocabulary choice that was. But today is a very special day. Um, Magical writing has been on a, just a short bit of a hiatus because we've been trying to figure out what direction we want to go to best help authors and to best help our own practices. Um, but we wanted to come back because today we have a very special book written by Joseph um, that is going to be beneficial to all authors. It's called The Divine, um, and it's for writers who want to increase their creative output and deeper their understanding of creative practices. Um, and since we're talking on magical writing, I'm also going to sneak this onto horror business. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's got that occult theme. You know, there's a lot of heart and soul in this book. And it's even though it has the fundamentals and the structure, which we're going to talk about a bunch today, there's so much more to it. And so it's definitely a book that deserves to have a spot on magical writing, um, as well as bookshelves with other books on writing, such as On Writing by Stephen King and the likes. Um, so Joseph, we're going to jump right into it today. Um, what is the five act structure? Oh, very good question. Um, the five act structure is a complete lifesaver <laughs> on a more grounded level. Um, it is a tool that a very ancient tool, actually, that allows writers to create the best possible story that they can. And it's a really interesting tool because obviously this being magical writing, it connects to some esoteric principles really powerfully but it also connects to some really interesting psychological scientific principles. And so uh, it is this immense, um, powerful map that will allow you to navigate through your stories on an emotional level and, and an ideological level uh, and plot level too. And it will uh, supercharge your stories. So um, obviously there are a lot of models out there. There is the three act screenwriting model. There's Freytag, there's Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. This is very different from those. Um, it's more flexible in some ways and it's processional. So every uh, act, um, follows on from the previous act in an incredibly logical way. And so it really describes the cause and effect relationship of actions that will allow um, the journey of your narrative to make sense to the reader, to feel completely convincing and concrete, um, and to take them through the highs and lows in the kind of correct sequence. Because uh, we've all experienced films, books, TV series where we've said things like the pacing was just off, you know, and it's mm -hmm. almost something indefinite. We, we know it's wrong. <laughs> uh, we sense <laughs> it, but we can't exactly put a finger on why. And this is because I believe the five act structure, and this is connecting to the scientific psychological element, which I'll come to in a bit. Um, it's actually embedded in us because like I said, a deep, deep part of our psyche and the whole way that we think. Uh, so we know it's there, but most people have not brought this into our consciousness. It's just lurking in the subconscious. So we can sense the pacing's off. Something wasn't quite right there, but we don't know how to describe it because we've not brought it into our consciousness. Um, uh, and there are films as well uh, and books. Uh, a really good example of one would be Interstellar, where it's a brilliant movie. 
so many fantastic things about it, but it climaxes too early. Bang in the middle of the film, you get that scene where the 17 years has passed, time's flown away from him. Matthew McConaughey gives his A star performance, crying in the camera, and he realizes he's missed his daughter growing up, all that. By the time you've had that, you've got nothing left in the emotional tank. And there's an hour left of that film. Yeah. Uh, so when you see films like that, you see all the correct pieces are on the table, but they're in the wrong order. And that is where something like the five act structure can seriously uh, help you uh, with your narrative. So you may be watching this and you may be an experienced writer even, but you may have a specific book you're working on that you think, why can't I get this specific book to work? I've done it 10, 10 other times, fine, but this one isn't working. Or you may be someone who is during the process of writing your first book and thinking, God, how do I sequence events? You know, how do writers do that? And for me, the five act structure is the solution uh, to that. Mm. So um, when you're talking about pacing, I guess, is this the same as plotting when writers talk about, are you a plotter or a pantser and this idea of winging it? So yes, yeah, is, is structure the same as plotting? Oh, that is an amazing question. And um, my answer is no. Um, plots describe the actual events in a book, but a structure is deeper than that. It's underlying. And the great thing about <laughs> the five act structure is it is friendly to plotters and pantsers alike. Um, oh. In fact, I used to be a heavy plotter. You know, I would chapter by chapter describe all the events that needed to happen and I would map that to the five act structure. Now I tend to be slightly more of a pantser. I'm interested in discovering the story. But the great thing is that I can check as I go along against this inner deeper structure in order to see whether this is going to work. So even though I'm able to just kind of um, wing it and create scenes as, they, as they're falling, uh, just an internal uh, sense of the structure, holding the structure in mind um, allows you to um, make, take better risks, I guess I might say, as because that is what one is doing as a pantser, yeah. right? You are taking the risk oh, of yeah. <laughs> expl yeah, exploring uncharted territory, but that territory... Uh, although uncharted, you have a sense of, of what it needs to be because the, the 5 X structure is um, unlike uh, uh, other models that I've seen out there, just to go a little deeper into it, it doesn't describe, uh, they, they conflate plot and structure. So they might say, oh, in your uh, second act, you have to uh, have the monster revealed, right? Um. The thing about that is it's very specific. Not every story has a monster. Um, not every uh, film or book or story wants to use that trope. Um, and it's very limiting. And it's saying this thing has to happen. And then so what you end up with are books that feel like they're written to formula, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But the five-act structure uh, will describe the general uh, kind of... Um, agent or or, or uh, mood or uh, well we use actually i use the term elements of course because it's correlated to the five uh, elements in chinese philosophy which i will will expand upon i won't just tease you all with that i will expand <laughs> upon what i mean by that but fundamentally it describes something more archetypal so it doesn't limit you uh, and something like reveal the monster in this act uh, is written by somebody who maybe they're writing, uh, you know, creature features or they're writing horror or they're writing. And so they've only conceived of it in the light of their own genre. But this uh, five act structure works for any genre. It can work for a comedy as well as a tragedy. It can work for uh, horror and science fiction because it is dealing with really something that's really underlying the surface of things. Um, so plot goes on top of structure to, to return to the question. Um, and structure is the, uh, the, the underlying movement, the undertow, the current of the water, right? Uh, plot is like the yeah. pattern the waves make on the surface. But this is, this is an undercurrent. This is something deeper. Um, and, and therefore, I, I think, more universally useful um, mm. And, and I will say one thing. I will say, obviously, I'm advocating very hard for the 5 act structure. There may be a 1% of people who it isn't useful for. There's all, there always is. 
And uh, for example, if you're writing a sitcom, um, possibly Dan Harmon's storytelling circle is more useful because sitcoms are circles, right? They, they have to reset at the end of every episode. So, so yeah. there may be a 1% of people uh, watching this that have some niche other thing that is useful. But fundamentally, um, I think the five-act structure is the most useful storytelling um, uh, tool uh, in the world. And I think that is confirmed by the diversity of people who use it, writers in feudal Japan, uh, writers in medieval England, uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, the Romans, uh, I mean, all across the world, in all different areas of the world, uh, all different time periods of the world. Um, and of course, it's still used today by very, very famous creators such as Quentin Tarantino and Hideo Kojima. Again, yeah, a Japanese video game developer and an American filmmaker um, poles apart, yet they both use five act structures explicitly in their work. Uh, so it just goes to show, I think, just how useful and universal it, it can be. So Yeah, that, that embedded, it's just a part of us, like the archetypes. Yeah. I guess as you're saying that, and, and maybe you've already hinted to it a little bit then, uh, why five? Why not three or four? And I think it might have something to do with this, the elements you were telling me. So yeah. please. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, five is a very special number, isn't it? Uh, you uh, oh, right. know this all too well. And I'm wearing <laughs> my, my uh, pentagram here. Beautiful. Um, and the thing about five is it is a number that is primary to reality. So the human being grasps reality with five fingers, mm. five senses, five limbs, you know, the star of the pentagram. Every man and woman is a star, as Alistair Crowley said, um, with a capital S and, and probably, <laughs> probably six different meanings to that. But one of the meanings, certainly, I think, is the, the five limbed being is, is the supreme being of the cosmos and we are that five limb being with five senses five mechanisms to interact with uh, reality with and fundamentally and, and then so then there's an added strangeness in that the reality we interact with is also five limbed in a metaphorical sense because there are uh, five elements and uh, in the west uh, just to, to get rid of any confusion in the west we tend to think oh no there are four but um, in all the traditions of the East, there are five. And if you look at our Western system, actually, we do have five as well, but we conflate uh, some of the elements. So um, we, we've kind of like abridged them. But if you, if you really break it down, there are actually five. And so the five, according to Chinese philosophy, are wood. Wood then so and and I I, I tell you what I'll, I'll go actually into some of the deeper meanings later. I'll just I'll just go through the five. Okay. So yeah, give us it. the five now, so everyone. Okay, <laughs> everyone understands. So we have wood. Wood then uh, is struck by lightning and burns and becomes fire, and then that wood is burned by the fire and becomes uh, ash, which is of course earth. So we have wood, fire, earth, and then. What do we find in the earth? We find ore, we find metal. So then we have uh, metal and um, metal is uh, not just metal, it's also uh, air. And um, there is a very uh, specific uh, reason for this, which uh, we'll come on to anon. But then um, finally from the... Um, uh, from the air, we get condensation, which, of course, is water. So we arrive at water last. So uh, we have this uh, really um, interesting. And then, of course, the water um, feeds the roots, which then become a tree again. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle again. that completes. And in the uh, uh, in the Chinese system, this is also correlated to five seasons. So again, we, we to think, oh, there are four seasons but they have sure. five and uh, it's basically spring, summer, late summer. So summer is divided into two, uh, ah. autumn and winter. 
and these correlate to those elements. So we have spring with the tree growing, we have the fire of summer, the heat, and then in late summer, the uh, the heat means that everything is going to bear fruit. So we get the we get the earth, we get the like the the bearing of fruit, and then we have autumn where things start to decline and the cold winds come in. So we have the air metal, and then of course winter, the rain and the ice comes. And we get water. So this is the continual cycle of reality that we are all in and we're slightly divorced from it as modern people but e even now we can feel it and uh, so we have we are a five-limbed being in a five-limbed reality and thus uh, the five-act structure is five not four or three but there is one um, for those who you know are interested in the occult but need, need a little bit of that kind of weird science to go with it <laughs> here's a bit of weird science for you that and this is why I think uh, this is beginning to, it, by no means is the research done, there could be deeper research into this, but I think this is beginning to uh, explain and explore why it's embedded so deeply in our subconscious. And this is, of course, the model of grief, which is uh, Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. So what we actually see is um, when in a condition of loss, so the, it was originally designed for loss of a loved one, but it can actually relate to any condition of loss. You could lose your job and go through the five stages of grief. Obviously, you may not go through it in quite the same extreme uh, reaction as losing like a loved one, but it's still the same five step process. And this five step process is a, a denial. <laughs> uh, we deny it happened. We, we fantasize. <laughs> We get angry about it. We're angry at the world, angry at ourselves, angry at the person or, or the situation. We try to bargain our way out of it, uh, we, whether with God or with someone else. <laughs> we uh, then, when the bargaining fails, we get to despair and depression. But if we can get through the depression, which is the hardest uh, thing to yeah. do, we get to acceptance. And so basically what this means is that within each human being the five-step process for healing is already within us and so this is what narrative is it at its deepest level is a five-step process to heal the human soul mind psyche whatever you want to call it and that's the power we have as storytellers and so the five acts to me, correlate to these five psychological steps, to the five seasons, the five senses, the uh, fivefold nature of reality. So, um, and this isn't to say as well that there aren't other magical numbers. Um, three has its own properties. Seven has its own properties. Eleven has properties. Nine has properties. There's all. There's all. Lots of numbers have different properties, but um, right. five is uniquely correlated to to reality and to this psychological healing process. And so Kubler-Ross, Five Stages of Grief, uh, that's the scientific backing that I've got for this uh, five-stage, five-act structure. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, there is a, uh, a correlation, you know? It's within us, it's without us. I love the way you put that all together. Um, so what I, what I always find interesting, since these things are embedded to us, the first time anyone realizes this, it's always like, oh my gosh, I found out the secret that nobody knows. But then you find out, oh wait, they're, like you said, feudal Japan, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Hollywood, but it's also being used by, you know, ancient Victorian writers. There's just, it's everywhere. But when we discover it, it's so magical to ourselves because it is like discovering a part of ourself. Um, would, uh, are you willing to share how you discovered the five? Yeah. Uh, part structure how did that come to you then that's that's awesome yeah thank you that it's a great question and of course as you say we always believe we're really deeply original and then we realize like there is no originality and um, <laughs> uh, ba Nothing, basically yeah. i took a very unusual approach to this uh, when i was a kid i became fascinated by storytelling and I quickly realized that um, there was a hidden factor, an X factor, if you will, in the success of stories. So 
I knew friends who were incredibly good storytellers, yet not all of their stories were as effective, even though they were better storytellers than another friend. Um, sometimes that other friend who wasn't as good at storytelling would actually completely land the emotional punch. So there was something within the story itself that was actually a factor in whether the story worked. And I became completely obsessed by this. Uh, you know, I went to uni and studied creative writing and um, I read and read and read and read and read. And I was, I was desperate to find out what was this secret key that some stories had and other stories didn't. And most people, I think, in this situation would have started to read lots of craft books. And I did read a few, to be fair. But um, I like to do things the hard way. So what I did instead was try to backwards engineer it by reading classics. Basically, I went to Shakespeare, Homer, Virgil. I went to things specifically that had longevity. That So, you know, um, the American uh, literary tradition is incredibly fine indeed. But uh, I felt, OK, it, it's not got the length of time standing. I'm looking here for the for the Homer's Odyssey that's 2,700 years old. We still repeat it. We still retell that story. Why? Um, I went back to the real ancient work and, uh, you know, up to kind of like the medieval Elizabethan period, one or two Victorian uh, things and I read I read the Nordic epics I deep dived the Latin poets I read the Greeks I really uh, read almost all of Shakespeare's 38 plays I shouldn't have said the number because actually it is contested exactly how many are credited <laughs> to him some people say it's 36 and some say 39 and, and there's all kinds of different but uh, it's, it's roughly th between 35 and 40 and I read most of, I read or watched most of them and um it suddenly struck me, cross-referencing all the data I collated, bearing in mind that all these things were in vastly different mediums and forms. You know, uh, the epics, the poetical epics are divided into 24 books. So Homer's Odyssey is in, written in 24 books. Uh, Milton's epic, though, is in 12. Um, uh, Shakespeare's plays are in five acts, which, of course, uh, we will come to uh, a nom. So there were all these different mediums and forms, including film as well, you know, watching classic films, although, you know, again, the longevity issue was there, but 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 interested in why does this film work? Why doesn't this film work? Um, and eventually I realised there were five points in the narrative that determined success or failure. If, if the you know, there were other things that were that were important, you know, being able to write good sentences was important <laughs> uh, but <laughs> definitely helps <laughs> it does help it does help but you know it wasn't the be all and end all there were writers who could write incredible sentences amazing vocabularies amazing command of the english language yet could not tell a story for toffee and uh, had no structural integrity in their work and so this is what i figured out was that it was more important Controversy. It was more important than your uh, ability to write amazing sentences uh, uh, or even great dialogue. You know, it important. All of it adds. All of it yeah. builds. But fundamentally, there was something more important, and it was the structure of the stories and these five points in the narrative: the inciting incident, the complication, the turning point, the uh, descent into hell, or the revelation. It's, it's the same thing. You have to go to hell to. Uh, find out the truth and then the catharsis and and these five points i thought i was a genius i've done it i've done it and then of course i remembered shakespeare's plays are in five acts and so uh, mapping these five points to the acts i realized that was exactly how he'd structured his work and he himself had copied this from the Roman playwrights, particularly Plautus was a big influence on Shakespeare. A lot of Shakespeare's early plays were actually just retellings of Plautus's work, but often with a, with a twist, with a kind of English twist on it. Um, and so actually, and they themselves, the Romans were copying again from the Greeks and the Greeks were copying from uh, Egyptians and, and other people before them. So essentially there was this, this continuity, this through line 
Um, and this was the five act structure. And um, it was it was kind of fortunate that the playwrights were very actively calling it out and saying this is act one, this is act two. Um, whereas, you know, John Milton's 12 books, um, obviously it's not one act per, per book. There's a, there's, a, there's a slightly more, and that might even be what you would consider plot. Those 12 mm. plot points are being mapped onto a deeper underlying layer of, of the five acts. Um, so it's more invisible in that. And it would be more invisible in a novel. You might have 30 or 40 or 60 chapters in a novel, but right. those are those are being mapped onto this underlying uh, five acts. And so, yes, I thought I had discovered something totally original, uh, but it turned out to be this incredibly ancient thing. And then, of course, when I um, eventually started to become interested in occult things, I realized that there was this even deeper correlation. So initially my understanding of the five act structure was very much a surface level of these five plot points or five, I shouldn't use the word plot, but five narrative fulcrums, if you will. Mm -hmm. But then I realized it went deeper than that because once you start mapping these fulcrums to the elemental elements, you start to unlock deeper meaning. So for example, if we took act two, Kubler-Ross, anger, the element of fire, a complication. So at this stage, a roadblock uh, prevents our main character from achieving what they want to achieve. Fire burns us. We touch fire. We, we draw our hand, right? But mm. um, And this is frustrating, makes us angry. Um, and then what if we can get through this anger and frustration, if we pass through the fire, of course, then we get to solid ground, we get to earth, uh, and we get to something more grounded. So you, you can see mapping these elemental associations and psychological associations onto these narrative fulcrums, these kind of archetypal narrative fulcrums, um, can really deepen your approach to writing a story and um, taking your reader through something that isn't just like something they enjoy consciously or on a surface level, but actually those five waypoints, those five seasons that are imprinted into their brain, uh, imprinted into us from, you know, when we're a single cell in our mother's womb, you know, um, you're actually tapping into that. You're reaching them at that level. Um, and that's, that's where tears come from. <laughs> For those that's who love makes... to make their readers cry, um, you yeah. know, that's where the deep stuff comes from. Those was what makes a work enduring over all those years, right? It's what makes it last. You're awakening something that's inside of a person that, that maybe they didn't even know they had. Maybe, yeah. maybe your novel that you're going to create is that moment of awakening for them. And they think, oh, this person gets me. Just like we were saying earlier, we don't realize that it's all been done before. It's in, it's in each of us. But for you, your novel will get to awaken them. Um, and gosh, that's what I think when I read The Divine. That's really what it is. It's about really understanding the art, the creative process. And when you're writing, you're not just writing just you know, like you said, just a couple ideas down. Oh, this quick story. Those will get forgotten. But when you really connect with the divine and you write your story with that in mind, connecting with your reader, awakening in them, um, bringing them through all the cycles safely so they can go through all this grief, discover yeah. more about themselves. That's the divine here on earth, the creation with your five senses um, and bringing everything into manifestation. So for me, this is a fantastic book for every, every author. Um, even if you're not into the occult, since that can be a scary word sometimes, <laughs> yeah, brings you through it. It is is not like that. You're not going to be wearing robes and using a wand. He does it in the manner which was just discussed and saying there's something here in the world that's magical, and we all know it, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, and we tap into it from moment to moment, and we, hmm. in our darkest hours. We can see that. We can see the five act structure. We can see ourselves go through it if we're willing to admit it. Yeah. And authors, if you want to be that powerful force, uh, you really do need to connect in that in some way. So you've mentioned the five acts briefly. Give us some of it. Is there a little bit more you could hit on each one quickly for the reader who this is brand new to them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're quite right. Yeah, I started with the crazy elemental stuff, but really I should uh, should give just a, a, a proper overview of the, the five as they are without the associations. So um, 
we start in Act One with an inciting incident. And this is a phrase that is quite common to a lot of structural uh, discussions. The inciting incident is the event that sets everything in motion. Uh, I like to think of it actually as setting a ball rolling down a hill. Uh, and the if just to, there is a lot more in the book, obviously, uh, about this, but um, to just give a brief kind of insight uh, into it from my perspective, the, the phrase inciting incident is worth unpacking because there's a lot implied in that. Uh, to incite something is to, to invite it, to stir it up, to uh, instill, to plant the seed, right? We're in the element of wood. I can't resist. Planting the seed <laughs> that's going to grow into the tree, right? So something that's inciting is, 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 is evoking something uh, from your reader, from your characters. And then an incident. Well, an incident is something that is worthy of reporting, um so so many books i read you know they just start with someone like thinking about their day and you just think you know this isn't this isn't noteworthy um you know it's great that you know your characters and what coffee they like to drink uh, it, it's great but um it's not really uh, enough to me to be worthy of having a story around it you know right uh, I think Dan Harmon said, start your stories where they begin. And I think that's it's 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 almost um, it's almost idiotically simple. Uh, but that's the genius and beauty of it. I think it's very true. You know, start your stories where they begin. Start with something that is an incident that's worthy of uh, report. Uh, and uh, the word incident, a second thing to say about that, of course, it is um it is a specific moment. What it does suggest, I'm sorry to all my fellow fantasy authors. I love fantasy. It's so dear to me. But giving me 10,000 years of history, <laughs> it's not the way to begin. Start with the, with the, take us into a scene, you know, an incident, something that's mm -hmm. happening. And then you can drip feed me the 10,000 years of history later on. Um, and actually that is a great segue to act two, which is the complication, because uh, this is this is where you want to put any backstory, if there is backstory. You know, you've grabbed your reader with your act one, which is an inciting, exciting incident. Uh, and now uh, you can afford to take the pedal off slightly and give us some backstory. And the reason for that is that if, if act one is where we set this ball rolling, act two is called the complication. So suddenly, eh, and obstacles come in the way of the ball. Uh, if our character can just get straight to where they need to go, um, that is going to be a very boring story and it's going to end very quickly. So, you know, Lord of the Rings is always a really good example for me because I know the story like the back of my hand. I love it so much. And I think it's got a beautiful five act structure. And so, you know, act one we have the fellowship setting off from Rivendell and there's nine of them and they've been given their quest and, and they're all ready to go. And then in act two, what happens? Boromir dies. The Gandalf falls from the bridge of khazad -dûm. The fellowship is split up. There's a big complication. We think, oh, those nine dudes, they're awesome. They're going to go all the way to Mordor. But no, there's a complication. Um, and it's going to be a lot more difficult to get to Mordor now. So, the act two is a really important act. And actually, I think it is one of the most difficult acts um, because, uh, you know, we, we don't understand it as well. And I think a lot of screenwriting advice is about three acts. And so you just have this chunk in the middle. People are like, what, what do I do in the middle, you know? Um, yeah. And we do tend to think in threes naturally as a species as well. But when you break it down a bit further and you go to this uh, five uh, act structure, it kind of resolves that problem of what to do in the middle, which is the, the perennial problem of the writer. So, you know, act one inciting incident, act two, shit gets complicated. <laughs> Would you say that, that, that this act two where it gets complicated, is that, is that the hardest one you think for writers of the five that or... Is there yeah, one where they're yeah. lacking on more often? Is it more common to see them fall down somewhere else? That's a really, really good question. Um, I, I think, yes, possibly uh, two and five are the hardest. Okay. Um, okay. 
Yeah, five is probably the one actually that I've done the most work with clients on. And um, there are a couple of authors who um, specifically in the acknowledgements of their books have said, you know, thanks for helping me with the ending. Um, and I, I do actually think personally that um, it's quite convenient that a lot of people struggle with Act 5 because that's one of the ones I uh, don't struggle with. I, I think I'm, I'm quite good at ending a book, if I do say so myself, but I massively struggle with Act 1. <laughs> and, uh, when, <laughs> I was talking, when I was talking about that prologue and 10,000 years, like, you know, I'm speaking from personal experience here, yeah. uh, my friends, like I, I have done that and done it again and not learned from my mistakes. And I still, still struggle with, with, um, you know, a lot of people say my books are, uh, you know, slightly slower at the start and then, oh, but it's worth, it's worth the investment, you know, once you get into the, mm -hmm. the meat of it. And, and that's something I'm really working quite hard on. So um, yeah, everyone is, and every writer will be different, but in, if I was to say overall, two and five are the ones that really cause problems for a lot of people. Um, okay. Okay. Now that magic number three, what's our third act? It is a magic number. Three is a great number. Um, three is the turning point. So because of the complications that have, this is what I mean about the, the causality, the, the domino effect, right? So you set off on your journey, but there's a complication. And then because of this complication, crisis and then there needs to be a turning point we need to overcome this crisis right otherwise the story is going to end so uh you can't just have a crisis you need to actually have a way of overcoming the crisis um so so we get to this uh, point of crisis as a result of the complication we go back to lord of the rings uh, you know we have the urukai are going to destroy helms deep we have uh, Frodo and Sam are going to be eaten by Shelob. Uh, we have uh, some people watching this who have not read the book may be like, wait, that comes all the way at the end. But they, they rearranged the order <laughs> of it for the film. So um, in the in the films, it's the um, Faramir. Uh, it goes crazy and tries to kidnap them and oh, stuff. Yeah. Right. So they, they have a, they have in the film, they still hit the five beats, but they just tweaked it slightly. They saved the spider for last, which, to be fair, I mean, it's quite a dramatic thing to uh, to, to end on. So, um, yes. So we have this turning point. So uh, act three, it can sometimes be quite a long act because um, when you've got this big crisis to convincingly turn the crisis around, you've got to do a lot of work as a writer. You've got to make me believe that we can avoid this, this crisis. Um, and if you do it too quickly, your reader will think, oh, you know, they overcome the obstacles too easily. You know, it doesn't feel earned. Yeah. So you've got to really put your characters in the shit and then you've got to find a way to write yourself out of it. But um, some of the things that you set up in Act 2 may help you do that. As I say, the fire... Uh, purifies us to get to earth and the reason earth connects to act three is because earth is grounding uh you know we're grounded once we overcome this crisis um so that's act three so uh, then we get to act four which is 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 um another act i particularly like and having overcome this crisis with a turning point our, our heroes or protagonists, if you prefer, are ready to go to hell. Uh, they're ready to descend into hell because all the great heroes have to descend into hell. Uh, if you look at all the Greek myths, all the Greek heroes descended into hell. And why do they descend into hell? They don't go in just uh, to prove that they can. Uh, that would be a very modern story, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, just doing things <laughs> to prove that you can. Uh, they go into hell to specifically find out information. So uh, Odysseus in the Odyssey goes into hell to uh, consult the blind seer Tiresias. So Tiresias is dead by this point, uh, but you can still access his ghost in hell uh, and um, he's still got things to say. So you go to hell <laughs> to uh, find the blind prophet Tiresias, right? And this is why Act 4 is a revelation. And this correlates to metal, which is air. Those two are um, the same. In, in the East, they don't uh, 
uh, distinguish between the two. They don't have this uh, problem that we have of having to be um, uh, overly precise about that, that the two are correlated. And they are correlated and because, of course, the intellect is the sword that we use to sever uh, things. We, we use the sword to dissect things and to partition them off. So, um, and of course, air is what we use to speak. And in Act 4, a truth will be spoken into being which is a secret revelation. So uh, once we've gotten through hell, which should be the most, this is depression, of course, in Kubler-Ross, uh, this should be the most challenging, the most difficult uh, ordeal that your hero has to face. And at the bottom of hell, um, there's a revelation. Now that could be a revelation for the reader, or it could be a revelation for the character or both. Um, so the most iconic example of an Act 4 revelation, there is a brilliant one in Lord of the Rings, but it actually is quite subtle. Um, so I'll go for a more obvious one for Act 4, which is, of course, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I am <laughs> your father. Probably like the best Act 4 revelation of all time. I've, I've just got to hand it to him, uh, to George Lucas. Like, uh, it's astonishing. And if you think about all the symbolism I've discussed Luke has to go to the cloud city, the element of air, which is in Act mm -hmm. 4, right? So it's even, it, it's so archetypal, it's so deeply ingrained that even in, you know, Star Wars, uh, a cinema, piece of cinema, it's set in an outlandish sci-fi universe, like the symbolism is there. Um, it's it's crazy to consider it, you know, but there is a direct link there with five elements, with the five-act structure. And so Luke goes deep into the bowels of the Cloud City, uh, which is lit with this orange glow, which is very hellish. And, uh, and then, of course, he goes down and he fights Vader. And where does he end up? He ends up on this platform with this shrieking wind, right? This sh wind is mm -hmm. shrieking past him. And then, of course, the truth is spoken into being the secret, the revelation, uh, what the Greeks called anagnogrisis. And um, this is I am your father. And, of course, it breaks him, despair. Right, that the Kubler-Ross of despair, the, the revelation breaks him. Um and so that's like probably the best example of an act for revelation I could ever give. But it doesn't have to be as dramatic as that. It doesn't necessarily have to be a plot twist. And in fact, I actually think that plot twists are quite overrated as a, as a thing. I think inevitability is is better. And I think that's why uh, I think Empire is so good is because it is a twist, but it's also inevitable you know it may everything is contextualized and makes sense as a result of this information that comes to light so um you don't have to be writing big big twists and characters suddenly changing you know who they are uh, if it doesn't fit your story but your character has to realize something and so i guess to return to lord of the rings the big act four revelation is uh, when the hobbits get back to hobbiton uh, and in the book, it's the the Shire is gone. You know, they set out to save this thing and they get back and there's a mill and the houses have been knocked down and it's basically been taken over by industry. And the whole thing is a metaphor for, for how Britain was was changed by the World War. Right. Tolkien went away. He fought in the Somme, uh, you know, the, the most horrifying battle probably in all of human history. Uh, to defend his green and present pleasant land and then he came back and you know they destroyed like um, his country basically or he felt he felt that at the time um you know perhaps we might say now it was an overreaction but but fundamentally a way of life that once existed for him was 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 passing on was was changed was gone and uh, this is a shocking revelation for us and in the film uh, they didn't have time to do the scouring of the Shire, and that's fair enough. It would have been another, it would have been a fourth film, you know, at the end of it. Yeah. So um, what they did instead was they focused in on the internal revelations. That's like a big plot surprise, but with it comes an internal revelation, which is what Frodo says when he says, there is no going back. The, the experience has been too deeply wounding too psychologically and spiritually wounding to recover. He cannot recover. Uh, we saved the Shire, but not for me. And so that's the surprise revelation for us. You know, we think, well, 
you know, they come back to the Shire. Surely the film's going to end now, but it doesn't end. Uh, an amateur writer would have ended it there, but mm. Tolkien understands structure. Peter Jackson understood what Tolkien was doing with the structure. And so actually, no, there's more. We need a revelation. And the revelation we have, of course, is that this... Uh, um, this character has been broken by the experience. And of course, the wound that, that has not healed, uh, which is in itself an archetype, the wounded, the wounded king who can't heal, the Fisher King, uh, is, is an Arthurian archetype. Uh, and, and, and older still, it has its roots in, you know, really ancient mythologies. But uh, it's a blade that stabbed him. So metal, air, again, the, the hidden yeah. uh, patterns that underlie narrative are there um so uh even if it seems a small thing like that it, it's it's there there's an elemental correlation to it so we talked a lot about act four but it is a big one it's an important one and of course this is sort of the uh, i would say this is actually the climax of your story really act four is yeah. the climax the climax doesn't come right at the end there's something that comes after the climax and what is that now we move into act five so the final act is the winter, it's the water, it's the emotions, of course, water, it's tears. So here we have catharsis, and this is where the emotional healing takes place. If you have followed this, the act structure up to this point, and you've gotten your reader to this place, and you've nailed everything else, now, now they experience emotion. And what, how do they experience emotion? Well, in winter, something is lost. Uh, things die, uh, areas of land become barren, and, uh, you know, people die, animals die, uh, we come to the winter of life, and so something is lost, so something is gained, and that is not from me, that's from Tristine Rayner, who is a fabulous um, uh, biographist, and she wrote a book called Your Life as Stories, I want to give her full credit for that, nothing is new under the sun, <laughs> um, <laughs> She, she, she wrote uh, Your Life as Story, and in it she said uh, the, the perfect definition of a, of a kind of um, conclusion is something is lost, so something is gained. And, of course, we see this a lot in, in Hollywood where, you know, some character has to die at the end. They have to have a, mm -hmm. a sacrificial act. Um, and when it's done really hammerly, it, it doesn't always work, and that's normally because the acts preceding it haven't set it up. Um, and that can be a way, don't get me wrong, though, if you do it right, it can it can be a devastating way to end your book. Just because it's been done a million times doesn't mean it won't work. That's almost the point of this structure, right, is it doesn't matter how many times you do it, uh, it will still work. Um, but it doesn't have to be literal. Um, in a romance, for example, you're hoping no one's going to die, um, especially in a <laughs> comedic romance, like a light romance. A rom-com, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in your rom-com, hopefully no one's going to die. Um, but what might die might be someone's pride or someone uh, a character might decide to sacrifice their wealth, right? Love is more important than wealth. So something is lost, so something is gained. Um, so, in fact, that's basically the devil wears Prada, isn't it? She realises that she's lost her sense of priorities and, you know, it's really been important for her growth as a person to experience the success, to climb to that height. But at the end, it's like, actually, I need to um, uh, get rid of this because this is making me into a toxic person and I need to go back to uh, uh, kind of my more grounded uh, love. And actually, some people have um, subsequently rejected that arc in the film and said, no, she should have stayed with success and left, left the dude. He was dragging her down. <laughs> and, and that's fair enough, um, you know, if that's your interpretation. Right. But, uh, you know, fundamentally something is, is sacrificed or given up so that we can gain something. And of course, if you're writing a more bleak story, the sacrifice will be greater and the gain will be smaller. And if you're writing a lighter story, the sacrifice will be smaller and the gain will be greater. And that's kind of the sliding scale that you can use uh, thinking about your genre, thinking about who you are as a writer to find your balance. Uh, I think writers like Tolkien, um, you know, really were the masters of the bittersweet. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, you know, on, on paper, what's lost might seem small given how much it is gained. But when you start to really dig into it, it's quite a colossal loss, um, both in terms of 
personally, emotionally, and spiritually. Essentially, the defeat of Sauron means that magic's going to go out of the world. You know, it's yeah. it's quite a huge um, thing that is lost as well, and that's personally represented in Frodo, and then of course the elves leaving and all that. So that it's actually actually there's quite a lot is lost, but you have this bit of sweetness because um, there's the promise of healing, and um, you know. Uh, they've saved the Shire, you know, they've, they've, fought, yeah. they've saved Middle Earth, like life will go on. Uh, so um, that's a wonderful bit of sweetness. And um, that's kind of what, to me, is like the perfect balance. But that's maybe just my bias uh, there. So, so that's how I would... It is an enduring story. It is an enduring story. And of course, he similarly studied all the classics. Uh, he was yeah. a university professor and he... It's a master of languages and he, you know, knew old English and Nordic and all kinds of stuff. So he, you know, really um, was modeling his story on those models. <laughs> so uh, they and they, you know, were using the five act structure. Um, you know, perhaps they didn't call it the five act structure, but it's 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 this thing that's been around, I think, since since humans had consciousness and could tell stories, basically. And so, uh, yeah, because of that, his story innately has the five act structure. Um, and he did conceive, you know, it's not really a trilogy. It was one book, but the publishers couldn't afford to print that book because it was too many pages. <sighs> so they split it into three. And but, you know, that's why as a trilogy, it works so well. It sticks the landing. Yeah. Um, he wasn't making it up as he went along. It was one complete story, and then it got divided up for the for the sake of like financial efficiency. And um, you know, they just couldn't print that many pages either. I think that the, the binding would have fallen to pieces with with the technology yeah. they had at the time. So, um, so yeah, conceiving of your story. So, if you're writing a series, just as like a little bonus bit of content here, mm-hmm. um, you might want to think each book having a five act structure, but also there being a five act structure to your whole series. Um, that that's something to consider. This can be sh- stretched and contracted. You know, each scene has a five act structure in a way. Right. Um, you can really start to drill down and also expand at the same time with, with this, once you understand this cyclical principle. So. Well, I can, I see why act five can be extremely difficult for some people that the idea of the symbolic death is symbolic loss. It, and we're all at different stages. I know that the ending is something, sometimes I have a very clear idea in my mind of what I want for the ending, but there are other times where I'm like, wow, I, I kind of want to see it one way. I have an idea, as you said, maybe of loss, um, using the devil wears Prada. Maybe some people go, what? That is not how it should have been. And I think maybe myself and other writers should remember that's okay because this is maybe where that viewer or reader is at in their um, life's journey. And they see that as a very poor decision. Didn't mean they didn't get enjoyment from your book, but they disagree with the character at the end. I'm curious if when they go back, maybe a couple more years and they've had new experiences, if that ending suddenly is much more meaningful to them. And if some of these books that were like, well, it was okay. I know when I go back and reread, I read a lot of classics when I was younger, but did not keep it up as I got older. And when I revisited them now, I'm like, oh my goodness, this book was so powerful. And I just kind of poo-pooed it away as just a dusty old tomb of something. So yeah, um, that is, that's a beautiful, thank you for sharing the different five acts with us. No, thank you for having me on. It's been such a pleasure and um, I love talking about it, as you can probably uh, see from having uh, talked for so long. But I really think it's something that is useful for writers. And I think if something that, you know, just to take away uh, as maybe a final thought is that writers can really make this their own and it's very customizable and uh, you can fill this with your own energy your own spirit and so a good example of that would be true detective season one i love that season so much i think that is divine in its uh, what it actually achieves and the catharsis it achieves at the end and uh, without giving spoilers because if you haven't seen it it is something i think everyone should watch at least once even if you're not into really dark stuff um, and it is really dark but the um the brilliance of the ending is that what is really lost is time. And so, you know, if you can do that 
you really can do anything with this structure. Mm. Uh, it's not just on a literal level. Um, you can make this work in whatever way you want it to work. Uh, if, if what is lost is time or love or money or, uh, you know, it, it, it can be life, it, it can fulfill, it can be fulfilled in so many ways. Um, but it is just going to give you the stepping stones to get to um, where you want to be, which is hopefully uh, deep in your readers' feelings. <laughs> um, yes. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, I've already said this, but I, I think it's a, a very useful tool. And I think hopefully having watched this, you can go away and immediately put it into action and write down the five acts and uh, describe them in the way you want to describe them. If the complication doesn't kind of make sense to you, then um by all means relabel it and re rename it and reuse it this is not trademarked uh would have loved to have trademarked it but sadly sadly homer had done it 2700 years before <laughs> me so uh this is this is open source content there's more information in the book of course but uh, make it your own and uh, enjoy and may you write beautiful cathartic stories as a result of this Absolutely. And um, the Divine is available everywhere on August 11th. And again, in making this available to everybody, it's only, is it correct? 99 cents for a digital 99 copy. cents for the Kindle. 99 yeah. cents. So whether this is brand new and you're ready to discover it for the first time um, and having Joseph as your guide, or you're someone who's written for quite a while and you might be wondering, well, I think I know this. There's more in the book. There's so much more. Um, it will awaken that spark in you. So as I said earlier, please go down below, click the link, check it out. And uh, I can't wait to do this again because I have a feeling there's some more magic in this book that we're going to pull out and uh, Magical Writings will definitely be back on this. So Joseph, okay. thank you. I appreciate this addition to my writing library and uh, I'm excited to get to, to, get to editing and, and seeing, have I hit all the acts? I know that there's a few times <laughs> I haven't and I'm ready to, to write that wrong. Uh, thank you again for doing this and I can't wait for August 11th. Bye guys. Thank you.